Hi everyone, uh, I'll start with uh, Kunio Hime at the back. Cool, sweet. So, uh, yeah, I I'm Richard Taylor. I'm a teacher at AIE, but uh, I'm also on the side making a video game called Tech Hunter with a bunch of lovely people, some of them are here tonight. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, making your computer do the work so that your team members don't all have to, because, you know, otherwise you're gonna waste a lot of time, especially if you're making a really, really big game, which is what we're that uh, silly in doing with this one. Um, but we'll get there and it'll be awesome, so check it out at the end. So yeah, without further ado, making your computers do the work by making custom tools. Um, so to start with, hands up if you are a game developer and you'd like more time to make your games. That's a good start. Um, so I, I'm giving the talk to the right people then. So um, your team's time is really, really valuable. Um, so it's really important not to waste it. In particular, if you're doing like all the boring stuff that you know human beings don't like doing, like uh, an example we'll see shortly, like is that trigger on the right way and stuff like that. So like for starters, there's all the other interesting stuff that they might be doing in developing the game, like the stuff that you need a human to do, making interesting levels, solving programming problems that other people haven't solved before, um, you know, making cool graphic art, advertising your game on social media, all of the interesting stuff that humans have to do and that computers kind of suck at because they're not creative. But then there's all the other kinds of stuff that we all, because we're human beings, like doing outside making video games, like hanging out with our kids or our significant other, or playing a video game that someone else spent years making, or sitting on the couch, you know, watching movies or just going outside, and all that kind of stuff. So it's really important to me, as a human being, not to waste people's time doing busy work and they're helping me make a video game. Also, that stuff's not fun, so why do it? The idea here is to make computers do as much of that boring stuff as we reasonably can. We can't make them do all of it, but we can make them do a heck of a lot of it. The examples here are some off-the-shelf tools, and we'll come back to that later. The first one on the far left is uh, uh, a custom test, sorry, not a custom, uh, an automatic testing tool. So that's, uh, I think that one's the Unity test runner. Um, the one in the middle is uh, Azure DevOps uh, pipelines, which can do automatic builds. And one on the far right, once a build is done, it's not useful if it's sitting on my computer, we have to get it to other people or upload it to Google Play or something like that. And there are tools that can do that kind of stuff for us as well. So like when we do a commit in Git or Perforce or whatever we're using, a computer somewhere can do all the rest of that stuff for us so a human being doesn't have to stop making your game to do a build and send it to people and stuff like that. Um, so my intent here tonight is not actually to tell you how to make custom tools because like there's manuals for that kind of stuff. Um, what I really want to do is inspire people the next time you're working on your game and you run into a problem that like, hey, this is really boring, why am I setting this trigger to be on the right layer for the 19th time? Um, actually, I think my programmer can write a tool for that and it's like in five minutes I'll never have to do it again. I'm spoiling one of my own examples, but like that's what I want people to get out of coming to this tonight. So it's inspiration rather than instruction. Um, that said, we will get a little bit technical. Um, that's deliberately aimed at the programmers in the room so that you've got a little bit of an idea of how to start. Because once you've figured out how to start this stuff, doing it is actually really easy. Um, so yeah, no excuses after tonight. The other thing I really want people to get out of this, your engine is not like the only tool you've got. You can build on top of it, you can customize it. So I really want people to go away tonight um, thinking of your engine, like whether you're using Unity or Unreal or freaking anything, it doesn't matter. Um, if your engine is worth the salt, it's customizable, and that is really, really powerful. If you're not making the most of that, you're not getting the most out of your team or anything like that. So start thinking about that stuff as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about custom tools. So most of the time this stuff is either for a specific team or a specific project, or a specific problem you run into as part of that project. Um, basically, there's a huge productivity boost here that I think a lot of people miss out on by thinking that, you know, Unity doesn't do this thing so it can't get done. That's usually not correct. Um, later on, we'll also touch very quickly on off-the-shelf tools. because There's some that I think are really valuable for people to know about, um, but I'm just going to skim over those because, again, there's manuals for that kind of stuff. And hopefully when I tell you the benefits of this stuff, you'll be like, yeah, we've just got to go and do that. Um, I already mentioned this bit. So my examples are going to be done in Unity because we happen to be putting our game in Unity. But the principles here are universal. And they're not just universal amongst different game engines. Um, the first tool I wrote was an animation tool in Maya, uh, one of our 
um, clients give us like reams of music done. It was like, hey, can you make an animation for this? And I, I made a set down and after an hour he's like, hey, Rich, I've done the first three seconds. I'm like, give me half a day. I think I got this. Um, it took me more than half a day because I'd never done it before and I was learning a new scripting language as I went and stuff like that. But um, the really cool thing about that is after I stumbled my way through writing my first tool in Mel script, then like the client came in like two days later and like, hey, we've changed the music. Um, it would have taken an animator like another week, but we just in front of the client were like, oh, here's your new animation. And they were gobsmacked. Um, so that's kind of like the first thing for me that got me doing this stuff. Um, outside of our like typical game tools, Visual Studio is very extendable as well. I've never done it myself, but only because I've never run into a problem where that would be a good solution. The other thing that's really common is like uh, batch files or whatever your operating system has. Basically, you can tell your operating system to do anything that you could do yourself. So if you find yourself repeating things, figure out how you can not repeat them by hand. So jumping into some examples, the first two I'm going to do on the slides. The third one, depending on how we're going for time and how many people I see yawning, we might jump over to Unity and have a look at a live demo um, and possibly some crashes in progress. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so example one, when you fix something, try not to fix it once. Try and fix it for all of the times. That's not supposed to happen, right? Um, you're supposed to be able to drive through that door without flipping randomly. Um, so uh, basically, oh no, the something has the wrong something set. In this particular case, I built that stuff so I knew exactly what it was. A trigger was on the wrong light. So when wheel touches the trigger, the ray cast hits the wrong thing when it shouldn't, and then the physics sends you through the atmosphere and so on and so forth. Um, so like the, the sort of like the default human position here, I'll start digging through the hierarchy and change that back to where it should be. Um, in this particular case, I put the thing with the problem at the top of the hierarchy for the sake of example. But there's like 500 tiles in there and then a bunch of those tiles have sub pieces under them. And unless you happen to be the person who built the level, um, it's gonna be pretty tricky to find that because like there might be overlapping triggers and all sorts of other stuff like that. Um, also, this is a simple level, like it can get crazy more complicated than that. Um, so 30 seconds after I'm clicking through the hierarchy, I'm like, nah, let's fix this one properly. I'll just write a little script and then, well, no spoilers. I, I make myself a little button, set all trigger layers because it happens to be that this, in our game, we're lucky enough that all of our triggers can just be on one layer. So like I write a little loop, finds all the triggers in the scene, sets them to a particular layer. I click that button and now I was going to say boom, but there's no boom, it just works. Like, now I can do donuts through where that trigger was and everything's groovy. Um, the other groovy thing there, um, if there are any other triggers in that level, they're now also fixed and I didn't do anything. Um, so like as a once off, this is like a, a complex solution to a simple problem, right? A thing was on the wrong layer, so I wrote a piece of code to go and find it and click the button for me. Um, but uh, does anyone think that this is a one off problem? Good answer. Um, like, we build lots and lots of levels and they all have triggers in them. So this really isn't just a one-off. In particular, like we're going through an open world game and we go into one of our interiors and our drone bounces onto the wall and like drag. Now that's a 15 second fix because we look in the editor which interior was I in, we load up the scene, we press the button and we hit save and job's done. And it doesn't even matter if like one trigger was wrong or a hundred triggers were wrong or what wrong layer they were on or anything like that. Now they're just all correct. Better yet, now when I'm making new levels, I never have to worry about setting a trigger layer manually ever again. Because um, now I just make my level and I hit that button and I know it's right. And it's groovy. Um, it's a small one, but it's a very significant workflow improvement. So like that kind of thing. And if we look at the code for this, uh, I won't bother non-coders in the room too much. But basically the menu item bit, do I have a pointer here? Yeah. This menu item bit tells Unity, hey, put this function on the menu. Um, it has to be static so that you can do that, give it a name, and then you just write some code in here that's exactly the same as any code you write to change anything in the scene while your game is running. There is nothing unusual or special about this code. Um, but you might note that this derives from editor window, but that's a bug. Like, I shouldn't have put that there, whoops. Um, so, uh, this kind of approach can save lots of fiddly work, you can make cool bulk changes, which is what the next, uh, example is you can it's a really easy way to detect and fix common problems so like i was saying if i run to another one of our interiors and we run into something like that click this button it's now fixed 
It can also handle much more complex conditions than the example that we saw. Like in this particular case, all I'm doing is find all the colliders in the scene. If they are a trigger, put them on this layer. But obviously you can do much more complex stuff than that. Like if this collider is a part of a player, put it on the player layer. If it's got this parent, do that. If it has this component attached to it, like what do you want? Uh, you can do really complex stuff with that. Um, and the example that we have on the right, ruin tools. So that's a, has anyone noticed any vert snap stuff in Unity? Sometimes it doesn't quite line up properly. It's like often we're going through our levels and we've got like little shimmering lines somewhere. Or um, the, the the one that really gets my goat is when I've been building most of the level and I realized that somewhere like a long time ago, like 50 or 100 tiles ago, I sent something to the wrong vert and I've kept going and now half of my level slightly off filter with the other half. I'm like, oh no, where did I go wrong? So um, I wrote this thing. Well, I wrote most of it. Ben has since expended on a bunch. But like you open a scene, press a button to find the, the, the root of that interior and then you click another button and it just finds all of the tiles, it straightens them up, and that's it, I don't have to do anything anymore. So again, not only have I saved myself a whole bunch of like bug fixing after I've run into that kind of thing, I now don't even have to care about vert snapping properly in the first place. I can just put stuff down close enough, press this button, job done. Um, another really cool thing this, if we decide later on to change the format of how the interiors of our levels um, are constructed inside the hierarchy, you can just write an extension for this that's like convert the old format to the new format. And that'll be a bit fiddly, but then we only have to do it once once again, rather than, you know, we're going to have like 50 or 60 interiors and we could go through and fix every single one of those by hand, like that would be a couple of weeks work and then lots of bug hunting. So that's example number one, like doing little tiny simple things. Those scripts, uh, Adam was telling me about what he wrote a few days ago himself. He was saying it took him about two minutes to write and say, has already saved him a bunch of work. So that stuff's really neat. Uh, moving on, example number two, would you like GUI with that? which is an important question sometimes because a button isn't always enough on its own, right? Um, so like with that example, if for instance, I needed to have different triggers on different layers, just having one button might not be enough to say what goes on what layer. So sometimes we have to give our users a little bit of a GUI or some other kind of interface so that they can control exactly what it is that our tool does. Um, so examples of this are you might have to select different sets of objects or you might have to set parameters like snap everything to a grid and I want the grid to be this big or something like that. So uh, in this particular example we've got a replace with prefab button where it needs to know what prefab you're replacing the selected objects with. So like nothing too difficult here um, but nice and powerful once you've got that kind of thing in place. Um, so because I'm not an artist we've got this level the same one that we were looking at before and for whatever reason I've decided the floor has to have orange lines everywhere. So like I could go through the hierarchy and select all of the square floor tiles and delete them and then start vert snapping new ones in place. Like it's doable. In this small level it's probably going to take me two or three minutes so it's not a big deal but uh, I could just select them all. Uh, on the left they're all everything else is grayed out because I used the hierarchy filter tool to select them. Then I brought up that little window, drag the thing in, press the button and now it's done. And that took me again about 15 seconds. This is obviously a really contrived example because I wouldn't necessarily want to do that. But other things that we might want to do is, hey, I want a path that points through the middle of the level to give players some direction. And this is the thing that we actually do. The tool's not quite advanced enough to do this properly because at the moment it's just going to paint a straight line. But hey, I could fix it to not do that easily enough if I wanted to. Um, but the point being that's already given people building levels quite a bit of flexibility playing with our modular stuff. Uh, and it only took me a few minutes to write, which is kind of neat. Um, so yeah, th this takes tedious, time-consuming, possibly error-prone tasks, because I might accidentally introduce some of those little jagged corners or gaps again, and turns it into a 15-second thing. Because yeah, like select things, drag replacement, hit replace button, and everything goes. The other really neat thing about this one, which I will admit I put in last night, because I couldn't show it without it, um, that has undo support built in. So if you decide actually those orange lines are hideous, because, well, I mean, look at them, um, control Z and they all go away. Uh, undo support in Unity is actually relatively easy to add in. Um, so programmers like read that part of the manual and put it in there. Because uh, even when I wrote tools myself, it really irks me when I'm doing a bunch of stuff, I press one of the buttons I made myself and I'm control Z and something else random in the scene changes. Because um, that's really irritating. So 
Like, undo, it does make it a little bit trickier to write your stuff, but not that much. Unity have gone out of their way to make that easier, so definitely check that kind of stuff out as well. In this particular case, I think it was two lines of code, which we might be able to see in a moment. So the first half of this is uh, just, what is this one doing? Oh, okay, this is the GUI example. So the first half of this is actually just drawing the GUI on the screen. This actually doesn't do anything yet. So like, this one does have to be an editor window. It's not a mistake this time. Um, they've got a static method. Again, sorry, non-programmers in a room. We've got a static method that just opens that window. You don't have to remember that arcane looking bit of code. Just copy paste it from the Unity manual and change their class name for yours. It's always going to be exactly the same. Then you've got the on GUI bit. If anyone's unfortunate enough to have worked with on GUI um, in earlier versions of Unity, it works exactly the same way. But it does have this, where's my cursor gone? It does have this edit to GUI layout thing, so you don't have to position everything manually. Works really, really well for simple tools like the one I just showed you, where like I need a, uh, an object reference and a button and this kind of thing, and they should go in this order. If you're doing complex stuff, it kind of, well, it works, but it doesn't work as well. I find myself spending too long refining it to the point that I should have just not used the layout bit in the first place. Um, but yeah. The other important bit here is if someone clicks the button that does this to replace function. And this is super simple. This is, again, exactly the same as if you wrote code to do this at runtime, with the one exception of the selection class up here, which is basically something that the Unity editor gives you. It's an array of all of the objects that the user currently has selected in the scene view. Um, so literally all this does is loop over them, delete them, and put the thing, and make an instance of the thing I've given it a reference to, and put that in the old thing's place. Um, it's like, that's literally it. And uh, like I was saying about the undo being two lines, here's one of them, register the created object that I just did here, and when you destroy something with undo, that's its own special command. So like, two lines, and it's done, which is really neat. Um, oh, there's a slide missing here. So there was supposed to be a slide after this that points out that uh, not only does this make it uh, a lot quicker to to replace things and stuff like that, and there are lots of other use cases, like we can use this in our outdoor areas, like uh, I want to replace half of these rocks with this other rock, and like, boom, it's on, you know, 30 seconds or something like that. Um, the other neat thing about this is because it's so quick to replace something with another, it encourages people to experiment with stuff, which you might not do if it takes five minutes to swap something out to see if someone likes it. Now you can just, it's 30 seconds, but you can try five variations, like who cares now, it's pretty easy. Um, so that's a, another thing I really want people to understand about doing this kind of stuff. It's not just about saving time, it's also about increasing quality by letting you play with things more, so you can just get more out of the time that you do spend on stuff. So example three, X marks the spot. Um, how are we going for time, Adam? So uh, do, do we want to keep going in the slides, or would people like me to jump out and uh, do a live Unity demo that may or may not crash? Cool. Live demo it is. Let me see. Okay, so there are a couple of intro slides first. So our game is a treasure hunting game, which means that maps are pretty important, right? X marks the spot and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing that's relevant to this particular example is that we have a really large world. It's a chain of islands. Um, and except for the island that you're currently flying around, the others aren't loaded. We just have low-quality imposters in the distance, because, like, who wants to load 50 kilometers of stuff when you're only using two, right? Um, the other thing, we want to keep our maps up to date during development. We don't want to spend hours and hours and hours doing it. Um, like, it matters our playtesting, so sometimes our, we're not going to get useful feedback if people can't tell where they're going and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's really important that we keep these up to date, particularly as we go into the part where we're making lots and lots of content. Fundamentally, making a map is super easy. Actually, let me just... Uh Fundamentally, making a map is super easy. You open the scene, you put the, uh, the camera in the right place, you take a screenshot or whatever you want to do, crop it to size, apply effects, and save the image where you want the map, right? So it's not difficult. Although anyone who's done this already can see that there's like issues with this workflow, like how do I make sure that the resolution's always exactly the same? So you immediately win from, con from a consistency point of view if you don't do it this way. Um, but the other kind of neat thing that we have um, is just the time savings once again. So we have loads of these maps, so we have eight, but that's, you know, enough. Um, we do update them a lot, so instead of spending like 20 minutes every time we make a change to our map, let's once again get that down to one button. It's like create an island map images and it'll go and it'll just make everything. 
I want to press escape and not the power button because that would be even more embarrassing than I'm planning. So uh, if we have a look here, I've made it super obvious. So uh, when the game pops open, I'll open the map. So like, uh, oh no, our map is out of date. So uh, we, we should do something about that. Uh, so stop playing the game. So we're aiming for one button, right? So I go to my handy little tech hunter menu, come down to generate island map images, and I hope nothing crashes. You can tell this is fancy because I have a progress bar. <laughs> Takes about 15 seconds. F 15 seconds seems to be like the magic number for when I automate things. Don't know why. And that's it. So we have a look in our uh, hierarchy now. So if we uh, grab one of those island images, should have showed it to you in here before. So like we can now see, well, this little tiny thing down here. Instead of uh, a, a meme picture saying the map is alive, we've now actually got pictures of our islands. So now if I hit the play button again, nothing's crashed, I'm really happy. I said, ah, oh, I, I know what's happened here. Yeah, it's because uh, my uh, not amazing tool writing I'll explain why that happened in a second, actually. But, uh, so now that we're back to the scene where the game actually plays, in a few seconds. <clears throat> where was I? <clears throat> where was I? So now we've uh, run through our progress bar, and then boom, we have maps. And like, again, 15-ish seconds, uh, except for the bit where I forgot to go back to the right scene. Um, so like, nice and easy. So, or at least nice and easy for our developers now. There's a whole bunch of benefits to that. Like, uh, one thing we haven't done yet, but we plan to do, is put stuff in there so that uh, instead of the map just being a screenshot of the island from above, we'll put filters on it so it looks like it's a map or a satellite image or uh, whatever. And our graphic designer decides to fix our theme and stuff like that. I'm a programmer, I just make it work. Um, so if we jump back to here, So, this one does require a bit of setup in different scenes. Um, so instead of making a GUI for this one, there's a component that you drag into a scene that has the camera and a light and a couple of other bits in it. Um, well, a camera, a light, and one number that you have to set, actually. Um, I rewrote on the weekend, because um, I, I was looking at it for this talk, and I was like, I can make that better. So I, I did. Um, but yeah, a, a couple of, uh, well, one thing you drag into each scene that you want uh, a map of, um, it's also a bit more complex in the code because this has to work with cameras and textures and files um, and has a progress bar, so it's, it's cool, right? Um, one thing to note here, this script modifies the scenes, um, which is really bad, so don't save it. Because basically it goes through and it rips all of the lighting out of the scene so that the maps are consistent. Uh, you don't want to accidentally save them like that because then all of the artists or level designers are going to be real upset when they make a map and then suddenly your, your game looks like the map, not the actual scenes they spent ages making. So skip through this stuff. So uh, basically the algorithm here, again, sorry non-coders, uh, at least they didn't put the code on the screen this time because there's too much. First of all, this uses the uh, Unity uh, build settings in the editor and that just gets a list of all of the scenes that are currently being built into your game. Um, I know that if it's not in the build you can't go there so you don't need a map for it. So that's just an easy way for me to not spend time looking at scenes I don't actually care about. Um, there's a bit more optimization in there that I just have a hacky one minute check. If the scene name doesn't have island in it, I also skip it. Um, so once it's found a list of those scenes, it opens each one. That's why I'm skipping the ones that don't have island in the name. And then inside there, it looks for that prefab that I put in there, the map image generator anchor. That's the thing that has the camera in it, that takes the picture of the map. Um, it sets the ambient light to black so that um, the different islands environmental settings don't modify or mess with the map picture when it comes out. It uses the attached camera to render an image. So that's really neat because a designer goes in there and they set up that camera once and then we could, like, job done, right? That, those settings will always get used until we decide to change the map. So we no longer have that issue of when I take a screenshot of the image, the map's in a slightly different image, so I'm mapped off kilter or something like that. Um, you had a bit of programmery stuff, you have to convert that image to a different folder uh, format and save it to a particular place, then you have to tell Unity to re-import them because uh, unlike if you modify stuff outside of Unity, it doesn't pick up if you modify files inside Unity that aren't Unity files. 
So you just got to tell it to do that. Like there's a lot of stuff, but individually none of those things are actually too complicated. They're all, once you're used to messing around with editor code, they're all relatively straightforward. Um, they look kind of ugly, but who cares, right? They get the job done. So the required island scene setup I talked about before, what I didn't talk about is in the world, you also need an anchor that tells each island image where to draw so that the map draws each picture in the right spot. Again, set that stuff up once, but also that thing you have to, regardless of whether you use a tool or not. Um, so that basically tells the map, draw these things like this. Um, so yeah, as you saw it, with that stuff done, making a map took, I think that actually took 30 seconds to, uh, to regenerate all of the maps in the world. Um, so like there are neat things we could do there that uh, if I remember, I will get back to shortly. Mostly what I've talked about here is uh, custom tools. So like bits of code that you write yourself to make your life or the life of your other team members easier. Like um, for instance, I don't want Anna like making maps for 20 minutes a week every time we change something. I want her making cool stuff to put on social media so that you know, people know about our game and stuff like that. So cool, the computer now does that for us. Um, the push of a button, which is neat. If we're doing stuff like uh, like automated builds, we can just tell the build server push that button for us, and now we don't even have to press the button ourselves. Um, so now our level designers don't even have to worry about telling the game to update the maps. So there's a whole bunch of off-the-shelf stuff which addresses really, really common cool problems that everyone has. They don't really fit into this talk, but I wanted to shoehorn them in here anyway, because so many people, including myself, overlooked them for so long. Quick show of hands. Uh, who uses version control? Good. I didn't include that one in here because I really, really, really hoped I didn't have to. Um, so we'll look at a couple of other things that I think everyone should be aware of. Uh, unlike version control, I don't think you have to use these for every project because the return on investment isn't always there, but you should be aware of them so you can make that decision. So the first one is automated testing. We're not using this in Tech Hunter, or at least we're, we're basically not. We do a little tiny bit of stuff, um, but like, for the sake of an example, we're not doing this, and I kind of wish that we were. Because it's a pain to set up in the first place, but then you never have to worry about the stuff you can automate again. It's like, computers can't test everything, but they can test a lot, and they can do it really quickly, and they can do it really, really frequently, which is all really good stuff for us. Um, examples, if anyone wants to start messing with these things, Unity has one built in called the Unity Test Runner, uh, and UE4 has the UE4 Automation System, um, which basically, they, the automation system lets you do a bunch of other stuff as well. But basically, you can hook up bits of code that test other bits of code and tell this thing to run them and then tell you if your game breaks, which is really, really neat. It can't tell you about everything in your game that might break, but it can tell you about a heck of a lot. And like, saving human beings from checking those things manually means that they can check the other harder things to test. Um, like, can you get stuck in that rock? And things like that. So the other thing I think everyone should be aware of is continuous integration or deployment, otherwise known as automatic builds. So the neat thing about this, basically you hook them up to your version control system. Every time someone makes a commit or like they might issue a command through Slack or something like that, uh, you have a computer sitting somewhere that grabs down the latest set of code and assets, does a build for you and then puts it somewhere that everyone can access it. So like, again, not rocket science, but these actually require getting a few different bits to talk to each other. So it is fiddly until it's set up. Um, but once it's set up, it's really, really neat. So cool things about this are you always have a current build. That's nice. Like if someone wants to test your game, you don't have to go and make them a build. You just give them like, you know, bit.ly forward slash random letters. And like, that's my latest build. And that is always my latest build, whether it's last week's or like yesterday or the commit I did five minutes ago. Well, 30 minutes, because it takes a little while for the build to actually get posted. Um, but like, there are some less obvious things, like uh, you will know straight away if certain types of errors are made. If someone commits, I don't know, but something I commonly do is forget to commit a particular code uh, code file into my repository, and this thing will be like, hey mate, can't build that. And it will tell me straight away in my Slack channel, which is really, really neat. So rather than Ben opening the project and be like, hey Richard, did you forget something? I know within minutes of having sent it. Like that doesn't even have to wait for the build to finish. It will tell me straight away in our Slack channel. Um, the other stuff that it can do, we're not doing this yet, um, but once you've got your game deploying to lots of different platforms, um, you can just, like, at, at the moment, if I want to make a build for a different platform, I have to, well, if the build server's not turned on, I have to go to the build settings, change the platform, wait for it to do some stuff. Um, it does have ways to speed this up because you can cache all that, but you still have to do the manual process of telling it to switch, then sit there and wait for 10 minutes while it compiles everything builds the game. 
Whereas I can just tell my build server, yeah, build for all of the platforms and it'll just do one, then it'll do the other, then it'll do the other, and the links will just pop up in my Slack channel. I'm like, sweet, I wanted to test the one on this device and I click the button and off it goes, which is really, really cool. Uh, so again, examples where you can find this stuff, we're using Azure DevOps pipelines purely because for small teams, Microsoft gives you that stuff for free. It's cool. So I recommend checking that out. Um, GitLab also has, I think, roughly equivalent kind of free stuff. And if you, because you probably have to have your own build server locally somewhere anyway, another one worth looking at is Jenkins, which uh, Nick on the front here can tell you a bit about. He set one up the other day. Um, so yeah, like basically the same thing. Um, it works, the, the service layer of that's a bit different because with GitLab and Azure DevOps, the repository says, hey, build service, a thing has happened. Whereas the Jenkins ones has to, uh, as far as I know, at least it checks every 10 minutes or something like that. But um, like it gets the same job done, right? Um, so then, hopefully you're all convinced now that tools are really awesome and everyone should go back and start making some next time you're working on your game. But in case you aren't convinced, um, they're going to save you time, and if, if you're making games commercially, they will also save you money by virtue of saving you time. They're going to increase consistency, like the map example is a perfect example of that. Because not only does it take me less time to generate all the maps, now they will always be exactly the same, which is really, really neat. Um, because of the increased speed, it also increases your flexibility and your ability to experiment. So people can be like, hey, I want to do a playtest build where like there's a giant rock in the middle of this map, and everything will still work and it'll just handle itself, which is really neat. And then five minutes later, I'm like, yeah, that was a silly idea, Richard. Like, testers don't like it, or whatever. But it didn't take as much effort to test that. Um, it enables new approaches to stuff, like particularly once you're using uh, this thing, but also to a degree this thing. Um, so like the, the automated build of a continuous integration. You can do stuff like, uh, every time it does an automated build, you can just start running your automated tests and then start giving you reports, uh, including things like, hey, on this particular platform, the frame rate dropped in this scene or something like that. It takes a fair bit of effort to set those things up, but if you're making a big game, like, don't be put off by, oh no, I have to give a programmer five days to set this thing up, because you're gonna be saving someone in your testing team weeks, like literally weeks. So think about that kind of stuff. It's not gonna be a fit for every project, but if it is a fit, think about it. Um, and because of all that stuff, it increases the potential scope of your game, because like, they've just saved yourself a whole bunch of time. You can use it making more stuff, right? Um, I'm not done yet. It will help you ship your games, particularly with the testing stuff, but just the whole like, now when I find a bug, I can fix it in all of the places at once. So like, saving time helps you finish stuff by buying you more time to do other things. Um, it takes the boring stuff off your hands, or at least some of it, like digging through hierarchies, looking for a trigger and stuff like that. Uh, it gives you new cool toys to play with. I spent longer than I should have messing with my build server because Hey look, what else can I plug it into? Um, and it also helps you avoid mistakes. Again, going back to that trigger layer thing, now I press that button and every time I know that all of the triggers are on the right layer, and you know, I mean, enough said really. Um, and on a personal level, it's really easy to get started making them. Like it looks daunting because you're not familiar with those APIs and all that kind of stuff yet. But once you start, it's actually really, really easy. So like, no excuses, give it a try once. It'll take you five minutes and then if you're like me, you'll think this is really cool and you'll think about it for any problem you run into later. Um, and the other thing, because of that, it increases your professional value. There was a particular time back at uh, one of my old jobs where we had a light bake that had like a dodgy bit on a particular piece of geometry somewhere. Um, and one of the artists was digging through all of the light bake files trying to find where the particular thing was so he could fix it in Photoshop because we didn't want to bake it overnight again just to fix this one thing. We had a client coming in shortly. So while he was doing that, I was like, I reckon I can write a tool that'll find it for us. Um, and, and the tool was like, it was terrible. It, it was incredibly expensive, like in terms of how it ran and stuff like that. He just basically did a, a lazy search through everything in the, in the scene that might have a light map attached to it, and then selected the file that was attached to it. So we could say, find the light map attached to this object. And then once our artist knew which particular light map I was looking at, he found it in 30 seconds. And then it was fixed two minutes after that, after he'd done through Photoshop. Like, stuff like that is really, really, really useful. It would have saved the people who were paying an hourly rate, like, you know, probably hours of artist time, because, you know, the job was done. So stuff for programmers to think about. Build, 
usually, not always, but you'll usually be the ones making the tools. As you've seen, the code can be simple. Really, don't worry about the quality of the code because no one cares. What they care about is that it saves you some time. If it throws errors in the console, like, really, who cares as long as it helps? Stuff like that. Um, it does not, for sure, have to be as robust as your in-game code because um, the people who are using it are educated. And if an exception pops up, then, like, as long as it's saving more time than it costs, then, like, who cares? Um, look for repetitive stuff that members of your team do and think, can I make a button that does that? Because if you can, you'll save them a whole bunch of time, which means they can put that time into other parts of your game or, you know, hanging out with their significant other or going outside or whatever else they want to do that's not making video games. Um, do get familiar with the editor API. It is very, very, very worth it. Usually they're relatively simple because um, they can be and they, they just make it so much more powerful for the stuff that you can do. Um, and the, the last thing, don't just make things, make things that make things, um, or make tools that make things, which sounds a bit silly, but like if, if you think about the workflow rather than just the functionality, you can get a lot more productivity out of the thing that you make and the people who are going to use it afterwards, which is really neat. For the designers in the room, think very much about workflows and how people do stuff, not just what the end result is that they reach. So like when you're designing levels for your game, don't just think, you know, what are the requirements for a level? Also think, what other steps that I want people to go through to generate a level? Because once you've done that, programmers probably look at it and think, yeah, these bits can be automated. Or if you change this to be like that, we can help like this or whatever. Um, on a related note, look for how parts of your game can be based on templates. Normally when I say this to designers, like, oh, no, we don't, we don't want to like lock people down to stuff. Um, but on that, be willing to compromise. Consider how much time you can buy by adjusting something so that a computer can do it so that then the human on your team can go do other more interesting things elsewhere. So don't just think I'm compromising on this thing, think about what it's going to get you elsewhere. Like if you look at the big games like Assassin's Creed and GTA, if you know what to look for, so much of those games are made by not necessarily templates but that kind of conforming to rules and like built as systems. Like someone didn't go and make every shop in that game uniquely. Someone made a shop system and a set of tools that lets you populate shops and then off it goes. Um, so be willing to compromise on stuff like that and then work with your programmers to figure out where the pro compromise can go to get the best results out of both worlds. Um, have a basic idea of what programmers can do and where they can make your life easier because that'll make both of your lives easier. In my experience, most designers already do this, but um, yeah, it's always worth a reminder. Um, and keep an eye out for repetitive tasks because this is where you get the best opportunity to optimize this kind of stuff. For artists, don't leave the room. Make sure you get, um, get involved in all of this stuff. Again, have a basic idea of what programmers can do, have a basic idea of how stuff's operating under the hood, and watch out for repetitive tasks that you can get them to help you with. Um, for good reason, a lot of artists are like, yeah, I don't want to raise that with the programmer or the designer or the manager or whatever because they'll think I'm being lazy. And unfortunately, sometimes that is kind of how they're treated, like the artist should just learn their thing. Um, but any good designer or any good programmer will listen because you're going to save the whole team time by raising, hey, I think we can do this more efficiently and then you can write a bit of code that will do it for me. Like, that's a win for everyone. Um, and if they don't listen to that kind of stuff, find a better team. Um, so, a couple of other talks that uh, might be of interest. Mike Blackney um, from Team Fan Club, if I got that right, has given a talk at GCAP the year before last, I think it was, for his game called Dead Static Drive. The talk is called Build Your Workforce Procedural Pipelines for Small Teams. It is available on YouTube at the moment. Um, you won't be able to click the link because it's a video, but uh, Google that, you'll find it. It's a really good talk. Um, his talk, first of all, it's for UE4 rather than Unity, so it's like uh, an example of doing this stuff in other engines. Um, but the other thing, his tools are about content generation, so they're actually quite a different flavor of tool to the stuff that I've been showing off here. Um, so it's really cool to to see how that has helped him specifically increase the scope of the game that he can that he is making. Because um, he's a small team, it might even just be the one of him mostly doing the stuff. And like, it's a driving game where you can, you know, drive around half of America and get out and like go into a petrol station and like order something at the diner. Like there's lots of stuff there. Also it's just a fun talk. Um, no video for this one yet that I'm aware of because this one's actually only a few weeks old. Um, Mighty Games, uh, Australian developers, I think they also work with Mighty Kingdom um, with this particular thing. They have a talk, Always Be Testing, A Journey Through Build Bots and Test Bots. 
Um, it's more wide than a how, um, but again, it's pretty cool. It's a great demonstration of the potential benefits of the off-the-shelf tools I just talked about. Basically, they have an automated build system and an automated testing system that uh, they automatically build your game and then they have like dozens or like hundreds of mobile devices that play it and find bugs and then send you back screenshots of the bugs so that your team can just arrive and be like, oh, that texture's misaligned or like, huh, this conversation tree doesn't have an end or like whatever happens. People just get reports generated by a tool um, that automatically plays games. Yeah, really neat. Um, so that's it for me. Any questions? Yes. So when you finished Tech Hunter, how much of the tools you've made for it do you think you'll be able to take on your next project? Very good question. Like, I haven't worried about modularity or reuse or anything because most of yeah. them have been very case specific, like I want to solve this problem. If we're doing stuff make that uh, has module levels, that stuff will probably be really useful because we might end up with a somewhat robust set of tools to like, you know, make these things not wonky and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, probably well, most of the stuff I showed in examples here are relatively game specific. But even the map thing, I was thinking while I was putting this all together, hey, like you could use this for anything you want a map of. You could use a lot of them could probably be repurposed as well. Yes. With, you know, the question would be more what percentage of time you've sunk into making tools. Yeah. Will still be viable for your next project. Um. Like, some of it. Over fifty percent. Quite possibly. Yeah. To be honest, like these things are often so quick to write that I'm not even worried about it because it's like. Like, yeah, okay. the, the return on investment that I'm yeah. looking into is stuff like if I do this five minute thing now it'll save me two minutes a hundred times so and stuff like that yeah. but yes I, I do suspect at least some of it will be reusable going forwards yeah. um, and a lot of the stuff that um, Ben's bought with him for like the, the environmental stuff that we're doing I think he's got a lot of like tools that he's made for other projects that he's just been like this is useful here yeah. paste and yeah. there it is yeah, yeah cool cool <laughs> Any other questions? Sweet, thank you all very much. I hope it was at least a little bit useful and well, I hope it was a lot inspiring. I hope people just go and start making tools because they're cool. Thank you all.